invite you to open your Bibles, and we're going to go to the book of 1 Thessalonians. We're going, where are we going now? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to begin at verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we'll begin at verse 1. When you arrive there, please say amen. amen. Once again, we're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. You know, as you turn your Bibles there, there was something that was told to me by your pastor and he said, so I feel like Noah. I believe that every true preacher of righteousness in this hour will begin to feel like Noah. Because the Bible tells us in the book of 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye already know them and be established in the present truth. According to the scriptures, there may be some things that we as the people of God are familiar with. We may know them. However, it is the responsibility of the preacher of righteousness to declare these very truths over and over and over again because according to the word of God, this is the only means by which we can be established in the present truth. Amen. And we're told by the servant of the Lord that there are many precious truths contained within the word of God, but it's present truth that the flock needs now. We see a crisis. It's right before us. Just like in the hour of Noah, we know the present truth was the flood is coming, get in the ark. 120 years, he preaches the very same message. At the end of the 120 years, eight people received the message. Brothers and sisters, let us not despise the truth, amen? amen. No matter how much you hear it, no matter how familiar you may be with it, God says it is only by hearing, understanding, and experimentally practicing these things that are declared to us from the Word of God that we can be established for the crisis that's right before us. And many, I have to say this, many will not be prepared even though we know the present truth. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So concerning the specific hour, the specific day, the specific week, the specific month, the specific year in which we should be looking for the second coming of Jesus Christ, is that information relayed to us by God? No. It's not contained within the scriptures, neither is it necessary for us to have that information. The fact of the matter is, if God gave us that information to the very day and hour, multitudes would still be lost. We have that information. We have that example in ancient Israel. The Jewish nation, they literally had a time prophecy concerning the first advent of the Messiah to the very day. Guess what? They were cut off as a nation. <laughs> if you look at the account in the book of Matthew, the Messiah was here for two years and they still didn't even know it. Brothers and sisters, it makes no difference if you have a time prophecy letting you know exactly when Jesus will come. The question is, are you daily prepared to meet your maker? The Bible says there's no reason for this information to be relayed to us, for we know something perfectly. There's, an imp there's a piece of information that all of us should have a perfect understanding of, and that is that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. We don't know the day, we don't know the hour, but we do know that the day of the Lord will come as a what? Thief in the night. Now I want you to see what Jesus says concerning his coming being like that of a thief in the night. We're going to the book of Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16, let's look at the 15th verse. Once again, we're looking at Revelation chapter 16, looking at the 15th verse. Jesus said, behold, I come as a thief in the night. I want you to see this. If you're there in your Bible, say amen. amen. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15, the Bible said, Jesus said, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. 
So we don't know the day nor the hour, but we do know that Jesus is coming as a thief in the night. And Jesus pronounces a blessing on those that understand I'm coming as a thief in the night. But the blessing is only for those that follows instruction. He says, blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So what should we be engaging in right now? Question. Are we living in the hour in which Jesus is coming as a thief in the night? Yay or nay? Yes. yes. So then Jesus says two things we need to be doing and we'll be blessed. Blessed is he that watcheth and then does what? Keeps his garments. So what should we be doing? Watching and keeping on our garments. Am I correct? Yes. Because if we're not watching, thereby enabling us to keep on that garment then we're going to be found walking in our nakedness and our shame will be seen. When Jesus comes as a thief in the night. Let's look at this a little bit closer because if you consider the instruction from Jesus Christ, you'll realize that there's a particular group in Bible prophecy that he says you're naked and you need some garments. Mm -hmm. Who does he make that declaration to? There we go. We're going to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter what? Act excited about the Bible. Amen. Yes. I don't want you to start speaking in tongues. Amen. I don't want you to start jumping in. The but I want you to be engaged in the word of God. Amen. Amen? Amen. Revelation chapter three. In Revelation chapter three, we're going to begin at verse 17. The message from the faithful and true witness to the Laodiceans. He says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind and Amen. naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. If there was one group above another that Jesus says you need some garments. He's speaking to whom? He's speaking to Laodicea. He's speaking to us. The very name Laodicea means the judgment of the people, the people that are living during the time period of the investigative judgment. Question, will you know when your name comes up in review in the judgment? So that event of your name coming up in the investigative judgment will be as if a thief has come in the night. You will not know the day nor the hour, but we are certain that the event will occur. Now, brothers and sisters, because we're certain this event will occur, Jesus says, what? Watch what? Watch the conference president. He's not doing right. Watch this sister over there. She looks sneaky. What should we be watching? We need to be watching ourselves. Matter of fact, I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Luke. Where are you going now? Luke, Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. I want you to see what the scripture says concerning this issue of us being in a continual state of watchfulness. We're looking at the book of Luke chapter 21, beginning at verse 34. Luke chapter 21, looking at the 34th verse. The Bible tells us here, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life so that that day come upon you unawares for as a snare it shall come upon all them that dwell upon the what watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that might come to pass that shall come to pass and stand before the son of Man, so when God tells us that we need to be watching, he says, watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things. What are some things we need to be watching for? Found in verse 34. Watch. Are you getting caught up in surfeiting? What is surfeiting? It's gluttony. Overindulgence. Overeating. Overexercising the hand that has the fork in it. Not putting restraints and you grabbing hold. Are you with me right now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, brothers and sisters, brother Chris, it's no, it's, there's no relevance. There's no relevance to the whole issue of overeating. Are you sure of that? Do you know the servant of the Lord says that gluttony is the sin of this age? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
surfeiting. Because just think about this. Do you think that Jesus made these statements not knowing that what he was talking about was accurate? Do you think he was just talking haphazardly? No, no. Matter of fact, even in his presentation of the things that we need to be careful about, do you think he gave them in unsequential, in a, in a, in a disarray? He, he didn't place them in specific order. Think about this. First thing he says is, watch out for surfeiting, gluttony, overeating, intemperance. Why? Because when you overeat, what happens? What happens? The digestion process, brothers and sisters, takes more blood than anything else. <laughs> That's why everybody starts passing out and talking crazy at Thanksgiving. Sometimes at potluck. Oh, have mercy. And so then we're sitting there and we're eating and you're eating and you're eating and the blood has to be focused on the digestion, but it's not focused on the reasoning and the judgment. Are you with me now? Yes. And therefore, when the reason and the judgment becomes benumbed because we have not gained control over appetite, then the enemy can come with his devices and deceive you, and thereby you fall to the drunkenness of the wine of Babylon. And when you fall to the drunkenness of the wine of Babylon, the only thing that's important to you now is not righteousness, it's not holiness, it's not living the sanctified life, it's the cares of this life. And then that day comes upon us unawares. God says, watch and pray. Am I in Jesus Christ? Watch and pray. How am I thinking? How am I speaking? What are the motive behind my actions? Watch and pray, Lord, purify me, sanctify me, keep me hidden in the garment of Christ's righteousness because when my name comes up, I want to be found in the Lamb. I want to be found hidden in Jesus. Because this is the only way the Bible says that we will be accounted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass. But in this hour in which we should be careful about the relationship that we're having with the Lord or the lack thereof. Are you following with me right now? We should be careful about eating and drinking and whatsoever we do to the glory of God. In this very hour in which we should be following the counsel of the faithful and true witness. Realizing that he's coming as a thief in the night. Look what the Bible says some others will be engaged in. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Because only those that are watching and praying and keeping on the garment of Christ's righteousness will escape the things that are getting ready to come upon the face of planet Earth. But the Bible goes on to say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, looking at verse 3, when you arrive there, please let me know. Just say amen. amen. It says there, but when they shall say peace and safety. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Question, do you think this group is watching and praying? No. It's evident that the group that's saying peace and safety is not watching and praying because the Bible says they won't escape. But those who watch and pray, the Bible says they will be accounted worthy to escape all these things. Are you seeing what the Bible is telling us? Yeah. So in the hour when we should be in a continual state of preparedness, there are others that are saying, don't take it so seriously. Peace and safety. Why are you worrying about what you're eating and drinking? Why are you worrying about what you're watching? Occupy till Jesus comes. Peace and safety. God says, Upon this group, sudden destruction will overtake them as travail upon a woman. Question, is it possible for a woman to be pregnant and not know that she's pregnant? Oh, there's no one that can answer that question. Saints of the living God, is it possible for a woman to be pregnant and not know that she's pregnant? It's possible. It happens all the time. Is it possible for a woman to go into child labor and not know that what she's experiencing is child labor? It is also true. Even though it is uncanny, it is still true. 
I always speak of a news article that I read concerning this situation. A woman went to the hospital because she was having some pain because she feared she had a hernia. She came out of the hospital with a baby girl. How could she go into the hospital thinking she had a hernia and leave with a baby girl? It's because this woman was not familiar with the signs that indicated a time of deliverance. Are you with me right now? Why are these people going to be overtaken? And I hope none of us fall into those ranks that will be saying peace and safety. Why will they be overtaken? It is because either they are willfully or unfortunately, ignorantly, unfamiliar with the signs that point to a time of deliverance. Are you with me right now? What are these signs? Go with me. We're going to look in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, a familiar chapter in the Bible. Most of us should know this chapter almost like the back of our hands, so to say, because we hear it reiterated over and over and over again. But as we heard earlier in 2 Peter, chapter 1, this is the only means by which we can be established in what? The present what? Truth. The present truth. We're looking at Matthew, chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 4, the scripture says that Jesus said, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. For ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Why? For nation shall rise up against nation. This is dealing with Races rising up antagonistically against other races. Are we seeing racial tension right now in our world? We see it in the USA. The only thing that parallels the racial tension that's in existence in the United States of America right now is that which transpired in the 1960s. Kingdom against kingdom. Civil powers raising up in opposition to other civil powers. Are we seeing that right now? We are literally hearing the discussion of the possibility of nuclear conflict. That's not a light conversation. That's how tense our world is currently. Famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. Are these things taking place right now? How many times have you heard this preached in the church? How many years have you been in the church and you've heard Matthew chapter 24 and verse 7 spoken of over and over again? And every time they said, don't you see these things? The church says, amen. Are you right? Am I right? But why should our amen be doubly so amen right now? Because the Bible says all these are the beginnings of sorrows. The word sorrows there means the beginnings of the labor pangs, the birth contractions. And you know and I know. When a woman goes into labor, if she has, if she has a birth, a, a contraction, and it takes place, let's say, at 2 o'clock, and the next one takes place an hour and a half later at 2.30, does it mean the baby's immediately coming? No. But when those contractions start taking place five minutes apart, mm-hmm. what does that mean? That baby's on its way. Mm-hmm. Any moment now, even at the doors. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, Is that not what we're seeing concerning those events in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 7 now? Before these things happen, spaced out. One thing happened this month. We talked about it for a while. Oh, need to get ready. Two or three months later, then we see something else. You can hardly go through one week without another event taking place. You get midway through the week and you're saying, oh, it's getting ready to happen. And as you're just as you're just getting your mind acclimated to the nearness of Jesus Christ, something else happens right on top of it where we're at right now we're right there at the edges of eternity the bible says these things are the beginnings of sorrows the beginning of the time period in which we can know that deliverance is coming what type of deliverance though look at verse 9 matthew 24 and verse 9 it says and then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and they shall kill you And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. It is a message that it is not being spoken of as frequently as it was in days past. But brothers and sisters, a time of trouble such as never was is getting ready to overtake the people of God. 
And as surely as we can say, yes, everything that we just read in Matthew chapter 24, verses 7 and 8, these things are occurring right now. We are also saying, amen, the time of trouble is right now getting ready to take place. Because those events are the precursor. They are the events that transpire before the time of trouble. We are right here. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. The Bible says, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. Who are these individuals that are going to be responsible for delivering God's people up into persecution? I want you to go to Matthew chapter 10 with me. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew the 10th chapter, and let's look at verse 21. Matthew chapter 10, looking at verse 21. Who is this group of individuals, they, that will deliver us up to be afflicted? In Matthew 10. And verse 21, the Bible says, And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. And the father, the child. And the children shall raise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. The Bible says it will be the FBI, the CIA, and the local police department that will do this. It says your very own family members, your brother, your sister, your father, your mother, your very own children that you had from your womb, you cared for, you clothed. They will be the agencies that the enemy moves upon to be the instruments of your persecution. It's a fearful thought, but it's a true thought because Jesus himself said it. And whom will they deliver us up to to experience this persecution? Go. We're going to the book of Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. We will look at verse 9. Mark chapter 13, looking at verse 9. The Bible tells us here, Mark chapter 13, looking at verse 9. But take heed to yourselves, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, and for a testimony against them. So the Bible says that our family members will deliver us up to these councils. And these councils will be comprised of rulers and kings. When you think of rulers and kings, do you think of religious authorities, ecclesiastical authorities, or do you think of civil powers? We're looking at civil powers. So our family members will deliver us up to these councils that will be comprised of some of the world's wise men. Some of... You know, we're told by the servant of the Lord in the book, Last Day Events, if God has ever spoken by me, we will be brought before rulers. She said, some of us will be brought before thousands. And in that hour, they will critically bring us into question concerning the very different aspects of our faith. And in that hour, many of us will become confused and we will not be workmen that, that are not ashamed because we can rightly divide the word of truth. Can you imagine? The very elder that you depended upon, he's confused. The pastor that you depended upon, he becomes confused. So what are you going to become because you depended on pastor and elder? Confused. You know, there's another word for confusion. Babylon. And that's where you're going straightway if you're not ready for that hour. When Babylon falls and you become confused concerning the positions of your faith, you're going to give up the faith and stand with those that are confused. It's a serious message. But God is going to have a people, let's say amen to that, amen. a people that will receive the instruction that Christ is presenting to us now, realizing the seriousness of what's before us, and we will begin now, not later, but now, to prepare ourselves to stand in that hour. Not preparing messages, not saying, okay, I'm going to go to this scripture and that scripture, but we will study out the various positions of our faith. Why do I believe what I believe? Why do I live my life in this way? So that when that hour comes, because we have been daily submitting our hearts to instruction of the Spirit of God, not simply to have an intellectual knowledge of these things, but that the truths that we're studying might be practically performed when no one is looking, that these truths might be practically performed. When there is no other eye other than that of the Almighty God to observe what is going on in our minds, we are living in Jesus. Are you listening to what I'm saying right now? God is looking for people like that. 
that in their innermost thoughts we are pure, we are holy. I want that experience. The Bible says that God is going to have a people in that hour that when he does allow them to be placed in those situations because these individuals like your Donald Trumps. Come on, Donald Trump needs the everlasting gospel, amen? Amen. These individuals like your Donald Trumps, your prime ministers, though they might not be available to you right now, when the time of crisis comes, God's people will be brought before them for a witness that they might have an opportunity to hear the message with all of the influence that the Spirit of the Lord can imbue man with. And in that hour, whether they hear or whether they forbear, they will have heard the truth. And they will be placed in a position to make decisions. God will use us as witnesses in that hour. But I want you to see what else the Bible says concerning these councils. Go back over to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, and we're going to look at verse 17. Because the Word of God gives us a little bit more information concerning these councils that I believe it's critical for us to comprehend. Matthew chapter 10, looking at the 17th verse, the Word of God says here, But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. Did you see something interesting there? The Bible said they will scourge you in their synagogues. The word their is a possessive pronoun. That means these councils have some synagogues. What is a synagogue? So you mean to tell me that in the final analysis of the great controversy, what is right before us is an issue in which God's people are going to have to deal with the union of church and I want you to think about this. You're at home. There's a knock on the door. Who is it? Man in black. What is he? Secret Service, FBI, CIA, whatever. As they come to the door, your wife, your husband, your child, your mother says, there he is. There she is. You're shocked. The parent or the family member doesn't turn to you and say, I hate you. They say, I'm sorry. They told me if I didn't give you in that they were going to cut off. I wouldn't be able to work anymore. They would cut off my benefits. They would take away from me my, my met. You have a greater faith than I do. Jesus will be with you. <laughs> and as you're taken off now and you're taken into the council and you're there, who comes to testify against you? The very pastor that baptized you. Now, brothers and sisters, that's serious. Because in an hour like that, you will feel as though everyone has turned on you. And there are some in our ranks, unfortunately. And when I say our ranks, I'm talking about the worldwide church in general. There are some within our ranks that think that for us to even consider a thought like this is totally irrelevant. But the only reason that they think that it's irrelevant is because the, the same Jesus they say they believe in, they don't listen to. Because Jesus said that we need to consider this. Matter of fact, he says, I want you to consider this. You don't have to believe me, but you have to believe the very words that came directly from the mouth of Jesus himself. I want you to see them in John chapter 16, beginning at the very first verse. John chapter 16, looking at verse 1. Jesus himself said, this is not something that we need to push off to the side and think that it's irrelevant. It is something that he wants us to know because it's going to help us. How so? John 16, looking at verse 1. When you were there, say amen. amen. It says, these things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. Look at verse 2. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Now, before Jesus tells you about you getting put out of the synagogue and you being killed by the very individuals that are a part of the synagogue, he says, I'm getting ready to tell you this so that you're not offended. Do you get the point? 
In other words, I'm letting you know what's going to happen beforehand because if I don't tell you what's going to happen beforehand, when it happens, it's going to take you by such great surprise that you will be offended. Think about it. If Jesus didn't let us know that our children would turn their backs on us, our parents would turn their backs on us, and then, then when we say, well, I can't depend on my own flesh and blood, but I can depend on the household of faith, and then your pastor is there to witness against you. Would you not become offended? So Jesus is telling us these things before they take place so that we can be anchored in none other than himself. He says, listen, they're going to put you out of the synagogues, and I have to remind everybody, the only way you can be put out of the synagogue is if you're in the synagogue. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So those that are running out of the synagogue, you can't get put out of the synagogue. God says, stand there. They're going to put you out. If you continue to stand in some hour, they will put you out. They will even seek your life. But Jesus warned us, I'm letting you know so you're not offended. Bible tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Verse 36, you know this scripture, I believe very well, many of you here. Matthew 10 and verse 36. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Not just the house that you'll go to when you leave here today, but this household. The household of faith. It's a serious message. And that is why Jesus gives very specific warning in Matthew 10 and verse 17. Where he says here, but beware of men. Stop. Beware of men. Stop. What does he mean by beware of men? Be paranoid of your family members. Your wife hasn't studied her Bible the way that she used to for one week. Be scared of her. She's coming for you. Are you getting my point right now? Yes. What is he saying when he says, but beware of men? Beware of investing the fullness of your trust in men. Beware of investing the fullness of your trust in men because men are going to be used as the agents of Satan to persecute you. That's why Jesus, God, makes this statement. We're going to the book of Psalms. Psalm the 146th division, I believe it is, beginning at verse 3. Psalm, the 146th division, looking at the third verse. Look at the words of the prophet and the king, David. Bible says in Psalm 146, looking at verse 3, Put not thy trust in princes, neither in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, and in that very day, his thoughts do what? Perish. Perish. Why is it even that as those who have the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, why is it that we who say we believe in God, we walk by faith, not by sight, those that make up Seventh-day Adventism, we also make up the Republican and the Democratic Party? You're not listening to me. <laughs> why is it that we have such vested interest in politics? as if this politician or that politician is going to be the savior of the nation. But then we run to and we say, oh, we believe Daniel chapter 2, when God, when God clearly declares there that he sets up kings and he puts them down. So when we see that a change, a transition of power is getting ready to take place, where should we go, to the voting booth or to our closets in prayer? But most of us put our trust in princes, don't we? as if there is some assistance that we will find in man. God is saying it is absolutely an act of futility. In other words, it is foolishness. It is vanity for you to invest your trust in a man that is flesh and blood like yourself. Here today, gone tomorrow. Because you can have your trust in this person. Oh, they're going to take care of me. Oh, they're going to take care of me. And tomorrow they're dead. Then where are you now?
Bible makes the same statement. Go again with me. We're going to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 17. Stronger language used in the book of Jeremiah concerning the same issue. Jeremiah chapter 17. We're looking beginning at the fifth verse. Jeremiah chapter 17, looking at verse 5. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and that maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. So God doesn't just say that it is a vain thing to put your trust in man. He says you're cursed. You're cursed if you place your trust in the intellect, the reasoning capabilities of another finite being to direct the course of your life. You're cursed. You're cursed if you trust in the arm of flesh. In other words, you're cursed if you trust in a man to be your strength, to be your protector, to be your provider. You're cursed. Because ultimately, if you look to the intellect of man to govern your footsteps, which Bible says clearly, the way of man is not in him. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. So if you put your trust in the intellect of another man, you're just putting your trust in the ways of death. If you place your trust in the strength, the ability, even the finances of another man to uphold you, God says you're cursed. Why? Because in doing so, your heart will depart from the Lord. You know that's true. And if we're honest, each and every one of us have experienced that sometime or another in our lives. I can speak for myself. What happens when sickness comes? We go to the doctor. I'm not sure something is going on in the body. I'm not sure what's going on. And you go and the doctor says to you, Oh, we found... <laughs> it's cancer. It's cancer. And the only way that we can treat this cancer is if you do this round of chemo. It's the only way to address it. But then on the other side of the coin, or should I say the pendulum, God says drugs never cure. They only change the form and the location. What do you do now? Put your trust in the all-knowing doctor or in the all-knowing God? Many of us, if we're honest, our hearts depart from the Lord. Now, of course, I've looked at the most extreme situation I think that I can look at, but we can look at various other smaller situations and be honest with ourselves and say, yes, my heart is departed from the Lord because I've placed my trust in man. God is warning us that we do not invest our trust in men in this fashion because the crisis that is right before us, it necessitates, it demands that our trust is not invested in man because if our trust is invested in man, we will not be able to endure the trouble that is before us. Let's see it again. Go with me to the book of Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, looking at verse 13. Mark chapter 13, looking at verse 13. In Mark the 13th chapter, looking at the 13th verse, look at what the scripture says concerning this issue. In Mark chapter 13, looking at verse 13, the Bible says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. All men will hate us. And I always like to address this issue. I really like to appeal to our experience to really consider. Because we read these things many a time, but we... I had a friend when I was younger. We would go to the store sometimes and buy, buy soda. Have mercy. Have mercy. We buy soda. And I remember I would get soda or maybe a slurpee or one of these things, these, these vile things to put in your body. And, and I remember one day as I was drinking from the straw, he looked at me and he said, you know, every time you take a sip from the straw, you go. He said, why do you do that? I said, because I purchased this particular flavor because I want to taste it. Are you with me right now? See, many times, sometimes we buy things and we just, 
guzzle it right down. Are you with me? That's the way we read the word of God. We just bloop. But we don't take time to taste and understand what God is really trying to communicate to us. Yes. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yes. So we have to take time with the word of God and just let it savor, so to say, on the spiritual taste buds. Mm -hmm. To comprehend what is this that God is trying to communicate to me. God says, you will be hated of all men for my name's sake. How many of you have been hated by somebody before? Oh, yes. Have you ever been hated by some, have, how many of you have been hated by somebody to the extent that you knew if this person had the ability to physically harm you, they would do so in a second's notice? Now, how did it feel to be in close proximity to an individual like that? That's totally uncomfortable. Because you're, now you take that feeling, take that experience now, and multiply it by seven billion. You'll be hated of all nations. Every man on the face of planet Earth that is not in Jesus Christ, which will be the majority, will have that same type of hatred for you. Brothers and sisters, can you understand that if you're not in Jesus, if we don't have the Spirit of God, we'll just be crushed. We will buckle just off of the hatred that's coming through us. Without any type of physical persecution, without any fine brought your direction, just knowing that the disdain of the people is upon you, you'll want that stain off of you. But God says, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Luke chapter 21. Same sentiments are expressed here in Luke chapter 21, but with a little bit different verbiage. Luke chapter 21, beginning at verse 16. Luke chapter 21, looking at verse 16. The Bible says, And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. Verse 17, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not a hair of your head perish. Look at verse 19. In your patience, possess ye your souls. In other words, only those that are patient shall be saved. We all need to possess a patience that can endure the crisis. A patience that can endure this crisis. And when God tries to help us understand what this patience looks like practically that can take us through an hour of crisis, he presents to us the example of one that we've spoken of many times in the sanctuary, in the church. We're going to the book of James. I want you to see who the Bible talks of. When God wants us to consider the type of patience that we need to pass through the time of trouble. We're looking at James chapter 5, going to verse... 11. James chapter 5, looking at verse 11. In James 5 and the 11th verse, the Bible tells us, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and ye have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So when God says we count them happy which endure, whose patience does he point to, point to us to, whose, whose patience does he point us to look at that illustrates the type of character that we need so that we can endure a crisis? Job. He says you have heard of the patience of Job. Job had the type of patience that is necessary to endure a crisis. And all of us are familiar with the account of Job found within the book of Job, chapter 1. We see the great controversy between God and Satan. We see how Satan comes into the council. We see how Satan professes that he's going to and fro throughout the earth, just holding all humanity, all of the kingdom of earth in check. But then God points to his faithful servant and he says, what about my servant Job? You realize that was a smack in the face of Satan when he said that. Yeah. Because Satan, Satan was speaking very boastfully, saying, you know, I'm just coming from walking to and fro in the earth. Have everything under, everything in the vice grip. God says, no, you don't. Remember Job? Satan, well was, Satan was 100% familiar with Job. He didn't have to stop for a second and say, who is Job? 
He didn't want to talk about Job. Are you listening to this? Because as soon as God points him to the life of Job, he says, does Job fear God or not? He didn't want to talk about Job. But he had to talk about Job. He says, the only reason Job fears you is because you bless him. Remove the blessings, take away the hedge, he'll curse you to your face. God says, fine. You have everything, everything that my servant has in his hand, it's now in your hand. You just can't take his life. The devil goes straight away from the presence of God, straight away. Houses, children, cattle, servants, Everything, one day, gone. And we're all familiar with this. And we say, yes, he had everything taken in one day. Brothers and sisters, some of us, you lose your, you lose your cell phone, you give up Jesus. Yes. This man lost everything in one day. Everything in one day. I mean, think about it. Okay, maybe the cattle, I'll stomach that. Maybe the servants, no. Oh! Children, many people are apostatizing now. You took my child, Lord. Why? But Job is standing fast through losing all of these things within a 24-hour time frame. Yes. Of course, the word of God lets us know there's one thing that Job didn't lose. We're looking at Job chapter 2, beginning at verse 9. In Job chapter 2, beginning at verse 9, the Bible said, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity, curse God, and die? Mm. The devil left behind one thing, didn't he? Yes. The wife. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but think about this. Did the devil just miss the wife? He didn't see where she was at. Why would he leave the wife behind? Because he knew that he had an agent in his wife. And think about this. If there was one relationship on the face of planet Earth that Job should have had very much so, his trust invested in, should it not be the one that is called bone of bone and flesh of his flesh? Imagine if Job was like many of us today, that we have so much invested in our relationship with our spouses that when our spouses apostatize, we doubly so apostatize. Mm -hmm. don't, don't, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Because there were many that you grew up in the church with that used to be in the church, but because the person that they yoked up their existence with stepped out of the church, so did they. As the spouse went, so went they. Job invested himself in God. He said, are you, she said, are you still being obedient to God? Look, he took everything. Are you still being faithful to God? Curse him and then go ahead and die. But the words of Job, and I believe that Job spoke these words with a long-suffering kindness that I'm praying for every day. Because in verse 10, he said unto his wife, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not also receive evil? In all these things, Job did not sin with his lips. Job had to look at his wife and say, Sweetheart, you sound like one of those foolish women speaking right now. You know, in the crisis right before us, many of us are going to have to say the very same thing. We're going to have to say, you know, you're speaking like one of those foolish women speaketh. What can a woman stand as a symbol of in the Bible? A church. Jeremiah 6 and verse 2, I've likened the daughter of Zion unto a comely and delicate woman. Isaiah 51 and verse 16 tells us at the end of the scripture, say unto Zion, thou art my people. A church is, a sim is symbolized by a woman in the Bible. I wonder, are there any foolish women spoken of in the scriptures? Jeremiah 51 and verse 7. Let's look at it. Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 51, looking at verse 7. The Bible here speaks of Babylon, and it says here, Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand, which hath made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. 
Therefore, the nations are mad. That word mad in the original Hebrew from whence it was translated means when you drink the wine of Babylon, you become a fool. So the wine of Babylon makes you into a fool. Question, are there any churches in existence that are drunken with the wine of Babylon? Yes. Yes. Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17, please go there with me. In Revelation chapter 17, where John the Revelator on the Isle of Patmos, attended by the angel, is given an understanding concerning the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, that is also sitting upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy. In verse 5, God opens up to John the character of this whore. In Revelation 17 and verse 5, the Bible says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. If she's the mother of harlots, then there's a lot of Babylonianish women running around. Am I right? Yes. Would they not be foolish women? Yes. I wonder. Are we going to have to say one day, you're speaking like one of those foolish women speaketh. You know, we're told by the servant of the Lord in late last day events, I believe it is page 179, I believe it's paragraph three. <laughs> we are told there that many ministers, many are standing in the pulpits with the throne, with the torch of false prophecy that was lit by Satan's hellish torch. or rather, by the hellish torch of Satan. Many will stand in the pulpit with the torch of false prophecy. I wonder if in these last hours, some of us will find ourselves in the church and the minister will stand before us and say, as he was studying the word of God last night, the spirit of the Lord impressed him that we were being too strict about this issue concerning the Sabbath. God had gave new revelation. Doesn't the Bible say love is the most important thing? We need to come together with our brothers and sisters. They're all in Jesus Christ. I wonder if some of us, in the power of the Spirit of God, and in the humility of Jesus Christ, in that hour, will be willing to stand up and say, Pastor, I'm not certain, but did I hear, did I hear you clearly? Because a moment ago, it just sounded like you were speaking like one of the foolish women speaketh. I want you to think about this. If we continue to listen to the T.D. Jakes and the Rick Warrens and the Joel Olsteins, if we continue to get our subject matter from this Sunday theologian and this Sunday theologian, can we not of consequence expect that we're going to speak like the foolish women? Brothers and sisters, but like Job, in that hour, God is going to have a people Amen. that will stand and that will not even sin against God with their very own lips. You know, when you consider that, that Job did not sin against God with his very lips, there is another group of people that are spoken of in the Bible that have characters that parallel that of Job's. They're found right there in Revelation chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. You know, we love to talk about Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12, which declare the three angels' messages. But many a time we fail to look at Revelation chapter 1 through verse 5, which deal with the characteristic traits that are truly the prerequisite to declare the message. Did you hear that? And the Bible says in Revelation 14 and verse 1, and I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand having his father's name written in there. Foreheads. If you begin at verse 4, the Bible speaking of their characters, it says there, These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Do they listen to the foolish women? No. Dropping down in the scripture to verse 6, if you're there, say amen. It says there, And they are without fault before the what? 
excuse me, and in their mouths were found no, verse 5 rather, and in their mouths were found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. In their mouths are found no guile. They do not sin against God with their very lips. Job stands as a type of God's people that will stand in this final crisis when every earthly support is cut off. Every earthly support removed. God is going to have a people that will stand. And when you realize that this is the truth of the matter, and the very fact that God tells us that we should consider the patience of Job, that should lead us to consider what was it that Job had embedded within his character that enabled him to stand in his crisis. Because if, jo if God is telling us, behold, we count them happy which endure, you have heard of the patience of Job. If God is telling us, look at Job, then he wants us to look deeper than the surface and see what was it that his servant had in his heart then that we need to have in our hearts now so that when our crisis come, we can stand the same way that he stood in his. And there's only two things I want to look at this morning and then we'll close. First thing is in Job chapter 23 and verse 12. Job chapter 23 and verse 12. What was it that enabled Job to endure his crisis? That will strengthen us to do the same in the hour of ours. We're looking at Job chapter 23 and verse 12. Familiar scripture to many of us here. The Bible says that Job said, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. In other words, neither have I departed from following faithfully all that the Lord has commanded. Why? For I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Amen. Job esteemed God's word more than the food that he needed to exist. Isn't that critical in an hour in which God says, take heed to yourselves? that your hearts be not overcharged with surfeiting. Remember that one? Yes. If you don't esteem the word of God more than, the, more than your necessary food, then when the counsel of God comes to you concerning your necessary food, you'll push that aside and keep your food. Are you with me? Yes. Job valued God's word more than the very food, the very sustenance that he needed to literally just exist. He says, give me the word more than bread. Brothers and sisters, are we not coming up into an hour in which we will neither be able to buy nor sell? How will we be able to stand in that hour when we will not be able to purchase the rations that we need to exist? How are we going to stand if God's word is not exalted above life itself? One of the reasons I like that verse of scripture so much is because when you look at that word esteemed, it doesn't simply mean that Job valued the word of God more than his necessary food. It means that he laid up. He laid up the word of God more than his necessary food. Think about this. Many of us, when we think about the time of trouble, unfortunately, there are many, that when they think of the time of trouble and they see the counsel that God has given us to get out of the cities into the what? Is that counsel good, by the way? Yes. Amen, amen, amen. So when he says to us, get out of the cities, into the country, many people say, okay, I need to escape. So I'm going to leave the city. I'm going to go into the country. I'm going to go into the mountain, to the top of the mountain. And I'm going to build my house there. And then I shall dig deep into the earth. And I will place my bunker there. And I will lay up my water and my food so that when everything comes, I... We have more preppers in the church. Are you with me right now? Yes. Okay. Prepping for the crisis. You realize the counsel that God has given us to get out of the cities into the country, it's not really to escape the time of trouble as much as it is for us to escape being in an environment that is continually bombarding you with sin so that you can be in the classroom of God to have a character that is fashioned after that of God himself. Amen. That's really what the counsel is all about. 
but some of us are looking that looking to the event that we need to escape. So we need to lay up and store for ourselves solar panels and are you with me right now? Yes. But Job, brothers and sisters, realizing that his crisis would come one day, he wasn't worried about laying up food. He was worried about laying up the word of God in his heart. Amen. If you didn't know that Job knew that evil would come one day, listen to the words of Job in Job chapter 2 and verse 10. He said, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God and not evil? In other words, Job knew that prosperity might not always continue. Good might not always be prolonged. Evil one day will come. And if evil comes one day, when it comes a knocking, I want the word of God stored up in my heart. That when my crisis comes, I'll be anchored Amen. more than is necessary food. We have to love the word of God more than our food. Willing to miss a meal more. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. Willing to miss a meal so we can feast on the word of God. Yes. This was even Jesus' experience. When Jesus met the woman at the well, he was hungry and thirsty hungry and thirsty but after he got to sharing the word of God and the disciples came back with rations he said I have meat that you know not of. I'm good now <laughs> when's the last time that somebody said it's dinner time and you said I have meat that you know not of <laughs> it's okay you don't have to say amen but brothers and sisters let me tell you something Everyone that will stand in this final crisis will say amen to that. Because in the great controversy, we're clearly told that in the crisis that is right before us, we will need a faith that can endure weariness, hunger, and delay. You know that statement, don't you? A faith that will not faint, though severely tried. Job was able to continually keep God's commandments even as he went through the crisis because daily he had a relationship with God that exalted God's word in his heart more than life itself. So Job kept the commandments. He was faithful. One other scripture. Go with me to the book of Job chapter 19. Job chapter 19, we'll look at verse 25. I know you know this one by heart. Job chapter 19. I know you know this one by heart. Job chapter 19, looking at verse 25. Job said, for I know that my Redeemer does what? And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Listen to what Job said he knew. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Job had a knowledge of the second coming. Amen. Not only did he have a knowledge of the second coming, Job had a knowledge of the resurrection. Yes. Because he said, after my skin, worms destroyed his body, yet in my flesh, I will see God. Amen. Job knew about the second coming and the first resurrection. Yes. How did Job know about the second coming and the first resurrection? He read it in the book of Daniel. You read it in the book of Revelation. Where did Job get this information from? Be Brothers and sisters, Job was the very first book that was penned. Job had to get the information from the very same place that Daniel and John got it from. He got it directly from the Spirit of God. Job received the gift of the Spirit of Prophecy. And look at what that gift of the spirit of prophecy did for Job. He said, for I believe that my Redeemer lives. Amen. He didn't say, I believe. That's what most of us say, I believe. Job said, I know. <laughs> Isn't there a big difference between saying, I believe and I know? Yes. What if I said to you, I believe I love my wife? <laughs> you say, I believe there's some problem there. <laughs> but if I tell you, listen, I know I love my wife. It's a big difference, isn't it? Yes. There is no question, there's no if, ands, or buts. To say I know is literally declaring that what I'm declaring thereafter is an absolute. There's no question. Are you following right now? And what made Job say I know? Because sometimes when the message comes to us concerning 
these things which God has given us in the Bible, in the spirit of prophecy, and people say to you, so you really believe there's going to be a time of trouble? And you say, well, I believe so. You need to stop saying, I believe so. I know. So you really believe there's going to be a national Sunday law. Before they can put the punctuation mark on it, you say, I know. Now, you're not listening to me. So you really believe that I know. If we can't say, I know that I have a redeemer. I know that I have a great high priest. I know the time of trouble is getting ready to come. I know there's... If you can't say, I know, I believe you have a problem. I won't say, I know. Are you with me right now? I believe there's an issue. Because when God gives us the more sure word, we can know that that thing which he has declared is that thing that he declared. It is truth. There is no variables when it comes with the word of God. It's certain. And because, just look at what it did for Job, brothers and sisters. Understand why the servant of the Lord says that the last, what will be the one of the final, one of the final attacks, one of the final deceptions that the enemy will bring to the church of the living God? To make the spirit of prophecy of what? Of none effect. Why? I'm going to show you right from looking at the example of Job. Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives. Job had boils on his body at that point, did he not? Yes. He was scraping himself with broken pottery, was he not? Yes. Here he is on the ground, hurting to the point that he would have desired death to overtake him. Yes. Are you, you just said that. Yes. I don't, I've never experienced that before. I've had pain in my life, but not to the point that I, I desired death to overtake me now. Now, you think about this, that you're in so much pain that you welcome death. But as you're in that pain, you start saying, I know that my Redeemer lives. What was the spirit of prophecy doing for Job? It was strengthening him to continue to go through his, through his crisis and maintain his integrity towards God, not to depart from his commandments. He says, even though I'm in pain. Even though I don't know why God is allowing this to come upon me, I can't even see where I did something wrong. But I know. I know. And so I'll continue to keep my eyes on Jesus. I know. So I'll continue to be faithful. Even until my last breath, I will not depart from the commandment of his lips. Job continued to be a commandment keeper because Job was holding fast to the gift of the spirit of prophecy. Amen. And it strengthened him to look beyond his present situation and to look forward to that which God declared would be his situation if he was faithful. Amen. Be thou faithful unto death and ye shall receive a crown of life. Amen. That's why the devil wants to make the spirit of prophecy of no effect because that God has given it to us so that we can know what's going on when the darkness blankets planet earth. Yeah. It's the light that shines in a dark place. Yeah. So when all is darkness, God will have a people that will be able to peer through the darkness. And even when it becomes so dark that it seems as though we can't see anything. Are you with me right now? Yes. That word will tell us what is beyond the darkness. Yes. Yes. The same way Jesus could not see through the portals of the tomb, he had the more sure word of prophecy. Amen. And he said, I will go forward. Amen. Amen. Job kept the commandments of God and the spirit of prophecy. Amen. And it enabled him to press through his crisis. Will God have a people like this in this final yes. hour? Yes. Revelation 12 and verse nine, 17. Revelation 12 verse 17. You know it already by heart. The Bible says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 19 tells us that 1910 tells us that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. And these people, the remnant that have the commandments of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy. What does God declare of them in Revelation 14 and verse 12? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen. Are you seeing this? 
Who are those that have that patience? Those who keep the commandments of God and they also have the testimony. But he said the faith of? Notice in Revelation 14, 12, he says they have the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Notice the faith of Jesus there is supplemented for the spirit of prophecy. Did you see that? Yes. Is that clear to everybody? Yes. Question. Do you think the spirit of prophecy was the foundation of Jesus' faith? I'll ask that again. Do you think the spirit of prophecy was the foundation of Jesus' faith? Yes. Brothers and sisters, if you have an awkward eye in the sky, then you haven't read the example of Jesus. Every step of the way, Jesus said, my time has not yet come. My time has come. How did he know his time had not yet come? Because he was following the spirit of prophecy. Every step of the way. Why did he know he was supposed to die on Passover? Because the Passover was a prophecy concerning his death. Amen. His life was governed by the more sure word of prophecy. Even in beginning to declare that gospel, he said, the hour has come. Every step of the way. He was moving according to the more sure word of prophecy. Amen. Do you realize that everything that we've looked at this morning concerning what we as the people of God, if we, remain our, if we retain our integrity as Job did, everything, every instance that we've looked at, Jesus himself passed through each one of them. Each one. Remember, when the mother and brothers of Jesus came, and the people said, Jesus, your, your mother and your brothers are here. He turned to his disciples and said, these are my mother and my brothers and my sisters that do the will of my father. Yes. He claimed his disciples as his family members. Am I correct? Yes. But then he turned around and said to them in Matthew chapter 20, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. Yes. Yes. Then one of them, Judas, turns around and betrays him, does he not? Yes. Into the hands of the leaders of the Church, did, wait a second, did they not take him into the council in the synagogue? Yes. Was he not beaten in the synagogue? Yes. Was he not brought to the rulers of the nation? Yes. Brothers and sisters, every last thing that we will pass through, Jesus already passed through. Why? Because the servant is no greater than the master. I always like to look at it from this perspective. Have you ever been to a marriage before and the bridegroom and the bride had different vows? Have you ever been to a marriage like that before? I love my sister right now. Think about what I'm saying. Think about what I'm trying to say. Understand the point. If the minister says to this one on the right, on the left, are you willing to take this woman as your wife to have and to hold in sickness or in Help. To death do you part. And the man says, I do. If the minister turns to the woman and asks her the same question, can she say, I'll do 50% of that? <laughs> Are you with me right now? Yes. The same pledge that he makes, she must make. Yes. Jesus pledged himself to us. Well, he said, I'm willing to go through this so that these people might be one with me. Now we in this crisis have to stand up and by faith say, I love him so much. Everything he did for me, I'm willing to do for him. Amen. Are you willing to take that vow? Are you willing to say, I do, in sickness or in health? To death do us part. I do. Amen.